Let us kneel together. Let us stand. Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection, sanctify your servants, for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Please be seated. We'll listen to the first reading. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human resemblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man. So shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those have not been told shall see. Those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a spalding before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor parents that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity. One of those from whom people hide their faces, spurred, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities 
that he bore, our sufferings that he endured. While we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced of our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was chastment that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth, like a lamb led to slaughter, or a sheep before the shearers. He was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked and a burial place with evildoers. Though he had done no wrong, no spoken any falsehood, but the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and he and the will of the Lord shall he be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light of fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant, shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked. And he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord. of all my foes I have become a reproach and object of scorn to my neighbors and of fear to my friends those who see me in the street flee from me I am forgotten like someone dead and have become Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My life 
shine on your servant. Save me in your merciful love. Be strong, let your heart take courage. All who A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confessions. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death and he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. seated. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that what was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus, the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also one of them, with them. 
When he, had said, when he had said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, Whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what, had said, what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your saw into his scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guard seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had consulted the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at a dis just outside the gate. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid, who was the gatekeeper, said to Peter, You are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around the charcoal fire that had been made, because it was cold, and they were warming themselves. Peter also was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken <coughs> rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one who, whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was morning. And they themselves did not enter the praetorium in order that they in order not to be defiled, so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this, at this Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone in order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said, indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Did you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king. You say I'm a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, 
Not this one, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him repeatedly. Once more Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man! When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now, Pilate went, now when Pilate heard this statement, he came even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him, so Pilate said, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you, and I have the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greatest sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called the Stone Pavement, in, who, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was, a, it was preparation day for the Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king! They cried out, Take him away! Take him away! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying his cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him and with two others, one on either side with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldier had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it will be in order that the passage of the scripture might be fulfilled that says, they divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus where his mother and his mother's sister married the wife of Cleophas and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to his disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over his spirit.
Now since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, but the Sabbath of that week was a solemn one. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when, they <clears throat> but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified and his testimony is true. He knows what he is speaking the truth so that you also may come to believe. For this happened so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone will be broken. And again, another passage says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, <clears throat> Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus. And Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths, along with spices, according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb, in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I would like to repeat some verses of the Passion narrative of St. John chapter 19 from verses 31 to 34. I will give you a reflection on that and what is the lesson that we could get from those verses. Now, since it was the preparation day in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken, that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs, but one soldier thrust his lens into his side and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified and his testimony is true. He knows that he's speaking the truth so that you also may come to believe. For this happens so that the scripture passes might be fulfilled. Not a bone will be broken. And again, another passage says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. So what happened in this story is the blood and the water, verse 34 blood and water which guts forth from the size of Jesus. Number one, what is the meaning of that? This is to fulfill, as you heard it from St. John, to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies. I can think of at least five Old Testament prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. The very first one is Psalm 34, and I will go very quickly because I know some of you are taking notes, so if you cannot catch me, go back to the live stream and get the note later. <laughs> Psalm 34, Exodus 12, the book of Numbers chapter 9, the book of the prophet Zechariah chapter 12, and the book of the prophet Zechariah chapter 13. So at least five Old Testament prophecies were written ab about the peer's Messiah. And then from this peer Messiah, we know that he truly died 
on the cross. And his death is not the end, but it is the moment of life giving, the source, the fountain of life, of grace and mercy and forgiveness are poured out to all of us. So that is the first meaning of the text, the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. Secondly, the death of Jesus on the cross here, with, especially with the size peers, should remind first century Jewish people of the story of creation, the book of Genesis chapter 2. When God put a deep sleep on Adam, and then while he was sleeping, God took what you read in the English version, one of the ribs of Adam to form Eve. But in the original language of the Hebrew, it is not the ribs, but it is one of the sides of, Jesus, of, of Adam. That is exactly what we hear in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 19. It is the side, not the rib. <laughs> so when, when Jewish people in first century, they reflect on second book, or second chapter of Genesis, they immediately thought of the idea of Christ as the new Adam, as the new um, um, spouse who gave life for the church. And how often we hear from the spear size of Christ come the life of the church, the life of the sacraments. Here you see water and blood. All right, so that is the second meaning, the new life, the new birth the new Adam of Jesus. Now, there's a third meaning in this verse 34, blood and water pour forth. It is for the first century Jewish people, and particular for St. John. Jesus is the new temple. In order to understand the new temple, we have to understand what is the temple, what was going on in the temple. So in just shortly and briefly present to you. The temple is a place where sacrificial animals was brought into the temple for sacrifice. And according to Josephus, the historian who recorded that there was one singular day, 200,000 lambs were slaughtered for the sacrifice. And could you imagine that huge amount of sacrificial animals to be slaughtered. Where do they get the blood flowing? <laughs> so they have to have the drain underneath the altar so that when the animals are slaughtered, the blood mixed together with the water will exit out of the temple through the drain. And then it is going out into the valley. So the people, in those days, when they came to Jerusalem for the Passover, they could see it is evident there is a valley of blood and water coming out from the sacrificial land. So here Jesus pouring out blood and water there is to remind us that he is the new temple. All right, so those are the theological and biblical meaning. Now I'd like to go into the second set of my reflection. What does it mean to all of us? All right. I think you, as you enter church today, you see two images that I set up today. One is the last vision of Our Lady of Fatima to what we call now Venerable Lucia, Sister Lucia, one of the three children of Fatima. Uh, this is a vision that appeared to her in 1929. And then there's another image there, the vision of the Divine Mercy to St. Faustinus, in 1935. So both of these saints, of Venerable and St. Faustina, are 20th century. So I, as I have scrutinized the text today, and I realized that the Word of God is inviting us to reflect on two very important gifts that God gave us to that flowing of blood and water from the pure sides of Jesus. So which one do you want to go first? <laughs> the Divine Mercy or the Fatima? 
<laughs> okay, let's go with the one that is closest to me first. <laughs> Since you have different opinions, different answers. So with the vision of Fatima here, it was in 1929, as I said, Our Lady of Fatima appeared to Sister Lucia when she was praying in the, cha in the chapel. And uh, together with Our Lady of Fatima with that immaculate heart burning with thorns uh, for the love of the conversion of sinners, then there's also the Holy Trinity. The Father is the, 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 the old man with the white hair and white beard that was kept at the top of the cross stretching out his hands. And then below the fa God the Father is the dove, the white dove, that is the Holy Spirit. And then below the Holy Spirit is the crucifix with Jesus on the cross. And there is the chalice floating in the air, catching all the dripping of the blood coming from his head and from his pure side. This is not just a vision that uh, Our Lady of Fatima and the Holy Trinity appear to Sister Lucia, but it is also a revelation of the mystery, the greatest mystery, the greatest gift that God gave us, as Saint, uh, Sister Lucia later wrote in her diary, that God was telling me and telling the whole world, any time that we attend Mass, That is when the sacrifice of Jesus occurs again in the unbloody manner as we are taught by the magisterium. Anytime the celebration of the, of, of the mass takes place, this is the sacrifice. That is why we don't call worship, we don't call service, you know, we call it the mass. And very often at the beginning of every single Mass, whether it is weekday Mass or Sunday Mass, I always remind people that this is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. So this is where we should gather together like you are at the foot of Calvary and you are present with our Blessed Mother and St. John at the foot of the cross. And that is where you could experience the sacrifice of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, and that lamb pouring out his blood and water in the blessed sacrament of the Eucharist that you and I receive in Holy Communion. So that is the first message that, that, that I, I got to remind us of the greatest mystery. So let this time be the beginning for those who haven't have that kind of devotion to the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Let's pray that you know, as you hear the passage of the Gospel today, you could... Pray for the greater devotion to the holy sacrifice of the Mass. So once we understand what the Mass is about, it's not just a gathering of a group of people and just running around and doing everything so busy, but we should take time. Yes, we need people minister to serve the church. We need people to run you know, the liturgy, but we do also want every minister, including myself, I have to remind myself, Take a moment to remember this is the sacrifice of Jesus, the Lamb of God, that I am here at the foot of Calvary and I want to participate worthily, wholeheartedly, so that I could receive the grace of the blood and the water that come out from the pure side of Jesus. As Zechariah is the passage that I love the most and that has the greatest connection with the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Zechariah put this way when he talks about the pious Messiah. On that day, the fountain of compassion and supplication will be open, and our sins will be cleansed and will be purified from that fountain. So that leads us to the second invitation of the second greatest gift is the gift of the divine mercy. What is the gift of the divine mercy? Uh, without saying much, I want to read number 299 of the diary of St. Faustina. And I just read exactly what Jesus explained. So I don't put any word, I don't plus, or I don't minus any word from the mouth of the divine mercy, Jesus. So this is number 299. Jesus explained about the, that water and blood from his pierced side. 
So number 299. When on one occasion, my confessor told me to ask the Lord Jesus the meaning of the two rays in the image. I answered, very well, I will ask the Lord. So during prayer, I heard these words within me. The two rays denote blood and water. The pale ray stands for the water which makes souls righteous. The red ray stands for the blood which is the life of the souls. These two rays issues fought from the very depths of my tender mercy when my agonized heart was opened by a lens on the cross. These rays shield souls from the wrath of my father. Happy is the one who will dwell in their shelter, for the church hand of God shall not lay hold of him. I desire that the first Sunday after Easter be the feast of the divine mercy. So Jesus was explaining, yes, just like Zechariah was talking about in chapter 12 and chapter 13, is the rays uh, coming from the pierced sides of Jesus are for our benefit. He truly died. He truly died in order for the gift of righteousness, the gift of forgiveness, and the gift of mercy, anything that prevents us from coming to the Father, anything that locks us out of the kingdom of heaven, those rays of blood and water are the keys that would open, unlock everything, destroy every obstacle that prevents us to God the Father. So we, we should come and take it, and not only the gift of forgiveness and righteousness, but in number 699 of the diary, and I want to read directly from the text so I don't miss the word, and these are the promises of those who really opened themselves to the divine mercy. So here is um, 6.99. On one occasion, I heard these words. My daughter tell the whole world about my inconceivable mercy. I desire that the feast of mercy be a refuge and shelter for all souls and especially for poor sinners. On that day, the very depths of my tender mercy are open. I pour out the whole ocean of graces upon those souls who approach the fount of my mercy. The soul that will go to confession and receive holy communion shall obtain complete forgiveness of sins and punishments. On that day, all the divine floodgates to which the graces flow are open. Let no soul fear to draw near to me, even though its sins be scarlet. My mercy is so great that no mind, be it of man or of angel, will be able to fathom it throughout all eternity. Everything that exists has come forth from the depths of my most tender mercy. Every soul in its relation to me will contemplate my love and mercy throughout eternity. The feast of mercy emerged from my very depths of tenderness. It is my desire that it be solemnly celebrated on the first Sunday after Easter. Mankind will not have peace until it turns to the fount of my mercy. So Jesus really invites us to come and use the vessel of our soul to take all that blood and water, not only at the daily mass and the weekend mass that we participate, but also especially on the Feast of the Divine Mercy because this is the day when all the floodgates of grace and mercy, it's just too much an abundance that would flow into our soul. And finally, in number 1075, Jesus not invite each one of us to come to get that mercy, but he also asks us to spread the devotion and this is the promise for those who spread the devotion. So if you want to get more benefit, uh, listen to this one. Souls who spread the honor devotion of my mercy, I shield to their entire lives as a tender mother, her infant. And at the hour of death, I will not be a judge for them, but the merciful savior. At that last hour, the soul has nothing with which to defend itself except my mercy. Happy is the soul that during its lifetime immerses itself in the fountain of mercy because justice will have no hold on it. So as we continue this celebration, the veneration of the cross, 
Let's pray for the grace that we could grow in a greater devotion to the Holy Eucharist and to the Divine Mercy uh, devotion. And for those of you who wish to participate in the Divine Mercy celebration and receiving all the grace, I want to remind you today is the beginning of the novena of the chaplet of the Divine Mercy. And uh, as you do that, remember um, to go to confession before you attend the Divine Mercy Sunday, which is a Sunday after Sun Easter Sunday, so that all the grace from the cross to the blood and the water from the pierced sides of Christ will flow into your soul and transform your lives. At this time, we are going to enter into the solemn intercessions. So I ask you, if you can, please kneel during this whole time of prayer. If not, then you could just be seated. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased and give her peace, to guard her and unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Almighty, ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy that your church spread throughout the whole world may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our Holy Father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Almighty ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded Look with favor on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people governed by you, their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith. We ask this to Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our Bishop Samuel, Samuel and Jorge, his auxiliary, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole faithful people. Almighty ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace, all may serve you faithfully. We ask this to Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts 
and unlock the gates of his mercy that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth they may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord Almighty ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children. We ask this to Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them in his one holy church. Almighty ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered. Look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for the Jewish people to whom, God our, Lord, to whom our Lord God spoke first that he may grant them to advance in the love of his name and in the faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church that the people you first make your own may attain the fullness of redemption. We ask this to Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they, they too may enter into the way of salvation. Almighty ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth, and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right with sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Almighty ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest, when we pray that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you, and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will, for to peace and freedom of all. Almighty ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rise of the peoples, Look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world, the prosperity of the peoples, the assurance of peace, and freedom of religion may through your gift be made secure. 
we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Dearly beloved to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Almighty ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of those who toil. May the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice because in their hour of need, your mercy was at hand. We ask this to Christ our Lord. Amen. We are entering into the second part of the Good Friday service, and that is the veneration of the cross. Please remain kneeling as we proceed the cross in the church. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world.
we do have a collection today, and that collection goes towards the Holy Land. In light of the gospel, I'd like to share with you uh, the latest miracle, Eucharistic miracle, which just happened last Sunday, Palm Sunday, in India. Um, and again, this is to prove that the Mass is a sacrifice of Christ who poured out his, his life for us uh, in the image of the blood and the water from his pierced side. So it happened um, about a month before Palm Sunday, uh, a Catholic um, person took um, a friend who happened to be a Baptist um, Christian uh, to go to uh, Mass. 
And then during Holy Communion, that Baptist friend was not instructed not to receive communion because she's not Catholic. So she just went and she took communion anyway. So she took it home and she did not know what to do with it. And you know, Baptist Christian, they read the Bible literally. So this Baptist believer thought of, you know, how the miracle, the power of God um, uh, work in uh, the Old Testament, for example, the Ark of the Covenant, when the Ark of the Covenant um, carry anywhere, then God's presence was there and he w protected his people, right? And then um, God instructed the people that do not touch the Ark of the Covenant or they are dead. And there is a guy by the name Uzzah who struck the, the Ark of the Covenant and he was dead. And then when the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines, the enemies of the uh, Israelites, so the Ark of the Covenant went to the lands of the Philistines and just destroyed all the pagan temples there. So she, this Baptist believer thought of those stories of the Old Testament. She was so terrified. So she did not consume. She did not know what to do with that consecrated host that she took from Mass. So she went to this Catholic friend, reported, and so they both ran to the priest, and uh, Father Johnson was a Carmelite priest who received uh, the consecrated host back from this Baptist believer. And he put it in the cruet with water and put in the tabernacle here to dissolve itself. And so it was on Palm Sunday, last Palm Sunday, um, um, he got a phone call to bring communion to the sick, and he opened the tabernacle and he saw something like dry blood the layer of dry blood floating um, in that cruet of water with the consecrated host in there. So he took his finger, he tested it, and um, blood was oozing out of the consecrated host. And so now the consecrated host is brought to the bishop of uh, Kohima for investigation. So with that story, again, I, will, I hope that you could be enriched in your understanding of the blessed sacrament that we are about to receive here. And know that this is a sacrament of love. It takes a life of the Son of God to die for us in order for us to be uh, forgiven and to receive life in eternity. Please rise. At the Savior command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil, graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and Please kneel. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be
Let us pray. Almighty ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And just a reminder, we just enter into the second day of the Paschal Triduum. So continue to keep the spirit of quietness and prayerful as you are still in church. Uh, so that we could show some respect uh, for others who are praying. And then to uh, help you to continue to keep this day uh, prayerful and holy as it should be for Good Friday, uh, we will have the church open from now until 10 p.m. tonight. So if you wish to stay around, do the station of the cross, reflect on the seven words of Jesus, last seven words of Jesus on the cross, or uh, anything you want to grow uh, in your spiritual life, um, ch the church is the best place to do that. And on top of that, we are uh, grateful that Deacon Danny will lead the uh, station of the cross at 6 p.m. today. Am I right? Okay. So 6 p.m. tonight. Um, so if you wish to join for the station of the cross, Deacon Danny will lead that tonight. Bow down for the blessing. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son. In the hope of the resurrection, may pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure. We ask this to Christ our Lord. Amen. And our Easter vigil tomorrow is at 8 p.m.